uh, session and good morning to everybody who I haven't greeted yet. Um, it's uh, our pleasure to start the morning session, which is very fresh. We have rested. I hope you took some wonderful walks around a Kirkwall. And uh, we, uh, we are focusing today on children's literature and adventures of the North, which is quite an exciting topic. The first speaker is Professor Dr. Johann Penzold from Universität Ravensburg in Germany. His research interests are quite broad and they comprise South African literature and interdependencies of history and identity, as well as genre theory and um, theory of poetry. However, today he will go with us into a little adventure into his third sphere of interest, which is Victorian literature for children and young adults. So, uh, Professor uh, Petzl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And, well, if, if you wish to clap, but wait, wait till the, I'm saying something. <laughs> anyway. um, yes, uh, let, me, let me just uh, add a little bit. Uh, I wonder if you agree, but I, I, I can see that in the way that we have each presentation and then uh, time for discussion individually, if you agree. Yes? Okay. Um, okay. Let me start with a question to the room. Who had known of Robert Michael Ballantyne before? Well, at least some. That's wonderful. Um, he was one of the best known writers for children, mainly boys, in the 19th century. Um, and you may wonder why, what, what's the connection between adventure and the North, and my research interest is not primarily in the North, but in 19th century popular culture. And that's how I came to Ballantyne, and he's become a kind of hobby horse. And luckily, he's written about more or less every sphere of the globe. So whenever there's a regional conference, you can draw Ballantyne out of the hat and say, yes, I can do something here. Um, but to come back to the question of adventure and, and the North, as many of you will know, in his seminal study, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell examines what he calls the monomyth, the adventurous journey of a hero. This journey starts with a call to adventure, which signifies, quote, that destiny has summoned the hero and transferred his spiritual center of gravity from within the pale of his society to a zone unknown. Now, arguably, the Arctic region still qualifies as such a zone unknown for many people. It certainly did in the middle of the 19th century. As R.S. Phillips points out, quote, in most mid-century British geographical imaginations, Canada, for example, is hazy and largely unknown, unquote, and even less was known of the area between the Canadian mainland and Greenland, although the area had certainly entered the British public imagination when the expedition led by Sir John Franklin became overdue in the late 1840s. In 1849, the British government um, had offered a reward of £20,000, and a number of search and rescue expeditions were sent out. Lady Franklin also financed a number of such expeditions. The last one left Aberdeen on the 1st of July, 1857. And the public debate surrounding its funding, because the government didn't want to give anything anymore, um, may well have drawn the attention of Robert Michael Ballantyne, an aspiring writer who had just published his first story for young readers, to the Franklin expedition. He certainly became interested in the topic because he published a non-fictional piece on the Franklin expedition a couple of years later. Such an interest in the North would hardly be surprising for Ballantyne, since Ballantyne himself, as a young man, had worked for the Hudson's Bay Company. So he knew the Arctic North, the Canadian Arctic. And his first literary endeavors were based on that experience. Hudson's Bay, or Everyday Life in the Wilds of North America, was his first book published in 1848. And um, that recounts his personal experiences, and he later fictionalizes those experiences and gives it a little more of a plot, though it's not particularly plot heavy, uh, in Snowflakes and Sunbeams or The Young Fur Traders, which came out in 1856. In his next two books, Ballantyne turned to South America and the South Sea, but he returned to the North with Angava, 1858, and The World of Ice or Adventures in the Polar Regions, published in 1859-60. The later text, or the latter text, will be at the center of my attention, and I'm really focusing on that one in the excerpt I would say I talk about two texts. In preparing this, I found out it, it's too much. I'll, I'll just focus primarily on um, the world of ice. Um, it doesn't make explicit reference to Franklin and his ill-fated expedition, but the plot clearly suggests the connection that I'm making here. Fred Ellis, that's the central hero of the tale, 
Um, his father was a captain of a whaler in the North Sea, and he gets lost. No word reaches back home for three years, and so young Alice, um, young Fred, manages to convince a friend who's a ship owner to have one of the whalers look out for this lost ship, and he himself and his young friend, the son of the ship owner, will accompany the ship and, and also have fun in the Arctic seas. The dolphin, that's the ship, travels north, eventually becoming ice-locked off the west coast of Greenland, and the crew have to spend the winter in the ice. They survive, and as I will argue, mainly due to the help they receive from the natives there, which at that time, of course, are still called Eskimos, and I retain that name when talking about those fictional characters. <coughs> And they are, as I will argue, very much a construction, a fictional construction. They, and they even manage to find and rescue Fred's father, so everything turns out very well in the end. This very rough outline may suffice to give you an idea of the plot. In the following, I will argue that Valentine presents an ambiguous image, ambiguous image of the North. While he presents the Arctic Ocean as stunningly beautiful, the story mainly highlights its dangers. Furthermore, I will show that Ballantyne's politics of representing the native inhabitants of the region are indicative of his Eurocentric uh, prejudices. Colonial discourse clearly colours the representation of the Inuit as other to the white heroes of the tale, while the plot inadvertently makes it clear that these white heroes would not have survived without their help. So on the one hand, they're looked down upon, on the other hand, they're necessary. The trip of the dolphin is no pleasure cruise, but Ballantyne emphasizes the surreal beauty of the Arctic landscape at various points. <coughs> Early in the story, the narrator describes a lovely Arctic day, and you have all the longer quotations on the handout. The sun shone with unclouded splendor. All round the pure surfaces of the ice were broken by the shadows <coughs> which the hummocks and bergs cast over them, and by the pools of clear water which shone like crystals in their hollows while the beautiful barrel blue of the large bergs gave a delicate colouring to the dazzling sea. Words cannot describe the intense glitter that, that characterised everything. Every point seemed a diamond, every edge sent forth a gleam of light, and many of these masses reflected the rich prismatic colours of the rainbow. This description emphasises light and glitter, and a few pages later, observing a different scene, one of the central characters is overwhelmed by the beauty, saying, I did not think that our world contained so grand a sight. It surpasses my wildest dreams of fairyland. And that association of fairyland is fairly strong in some scenes, and clearly inspired the artist of the book cover that you also have on the handout, from, not from the first edition, but an edition from 1893, um, that is clearly inspired by this fantastic element in the landscape. The image depicts a surreal beauty, but arguably the landscape also dwarfs the human beings and suggests a kind of danger. And indeed, when the ship becomes ice-locked, the beauty of the Arctic landscape is superseded by its ruggedness and emphasis is placed on the lack of light and the severe life-threatening cold during the polar winter. So while the Arctic is depicted as inhospitable, it is not devoid of human life. Indeed, native inhabitants of Greenland play an important part in the law. As I've said before, Valentine's depiction of these Eskimos is clearly marked by colonial discourse. They are presented as other to the European characters. That is, they are given character traits that are generally seen as negative, and hence they function as a negative foil that makes the European heroes appear all the more heroic and virtuous. More specifically, I will argue that Valentine depicts the Eskimos as ridiculous, repulsive, and utterly unrestrained, and that for a 19th century audience is a problem. The first time Eskimos make a more extensive appearance in the text, the context is clearly comical. The scene is introduced by, quote, a tremendous shout of laughter, long continued, unquote, and the object of mirth turns out to be the seaman dressed in Eskimo fashion, Quote, capering with delight at the ridiculous appearance they presented, unquote. While one might conclude that the spectacle is funny because the seamen feel as if they are in fancy dress, this is not the case. Rather, it is the winter dress itself that is inherently funny, since natives in their winter dress produce similar laughter. While Ballantyne makes fun of the Eskimos' dress, he also acknowledges that it is effective. 
when the Arctic, <coughs> when the Arctic winter sets in, the seamen find out that, quote, their ordinary dreadnoughts and pea jackets, etc., were not a sufficient protection against the cold, unquote, and the captain tells them to produce the winter clothing of the type worn by the Eskimos. Arguably, this paradoxical reaction forms the general pattern for Ballantyne's depiction of Eskimos. They are repeatedly ridiculed and or denigrated, but the narrator has to admit that their customs are indeed well suited to the harsh conditions. The following scene de describes the first prolonged meeting between Eskimos and the crew of the dolphin, and here the natives are depicted as overexcited children. Again, you have the quote on the handout. It was exceedingly interesting and amusing to observe the feelings of amazement and delight expressed by those barbarous but good-humoured and intelligent people at everything they saw. While food was preparing for them, they were taken round the ship and the sailors explained in pantomime the use of everything. They laughed and exclaimed and shouted and even roared with delight and touched everything with their fingers, just as monkeys are wont to do when let loose. The juxtaposition of the adjectives barbarous and intelligent is somewhat puzzling, particularly since the latter, the intelligence, has given little foundation in the description. It almost seems as if Ballantyne was deliberately attempting to find positive things to say about the Eskimos, but the general impression is certainly different. In this passage, the Eskimos are linked to monkeys, hardly a comparison that underscores their intelligence. And furthermore, they are described as overly emotional, as unable to exercise restraint, and hence they mirror children. This becomes particularly obvious when they express their joy at various gifts. First of all, however, a number of presents were made to them, and it would really have done your heart good, reader, to have witnessed the extravagant joy displayed by them on receiving such trifles as bits of hoop iron, beads, knives, scissors, needles, etc. But the present which drew forth the most uproarious applause was the Union Jack, which the captain gave to their chief, Abatok. Abatok gave went to a tremendous shout, seized the flag, hugged it in his arms, and darted up the deck, literally roaring with delight. The sympathetic hearts of the natives on the ice echoed the cry before they knew the cause of it, but when they beheld the prize, they yelled and screamed and danced and tossed their arms in the air in the most violent man. Again, the depiction is paradoxical. As the narrator points out, iron is as precious amongst them, the Eskimos, as gold is amongst civilized people, because they don't have much of it. And hence, the excitement at receiving practical items like scissors or needles is, to some extent, understandable. But while the narrator is aware of the cultural importance of iron, he's unable or unwilling to truly take on the Eskimos' perspective. Rather, by calling those gifts trifles, he remains within the British perspective and ridicules the reaction of the Eskimos. Furthermore, the expression of joy when seeing the Union Jack, which is of no practical use to them, or hardly any, is clearly marked as excessive. Not surprisingly, then, one of the seamen declares they are all made every mother's son of them. Handing out trifles to uncivilized savages is a common scene in colonial encounters, and emphasizing emotional excess is a typical feature of, colon of colonialist texts that construct natives as uncivilized other to European explorers. For example, compare the description of the Eskimos to that of Africans as it appeared in the Juvenile Companion and Sunday School Hive in 1861, so roughly at the same time. And this is the account of a missionary. As we drew near to York, in Sierra Leone, uh, we discovered a number of figures crowding on the rocks to catch a glimpse of us. They were jumping about in a way that is quite peculiar to the Negro when excited by great joy. <laughs> Apparently it's peculiar to the Negro and the Eskimo. As soon as I set my feet on the ground, I was surrounded by a crowd of black women dancing and shouting with all their might, and they also waved their arms about. The comparison shows that both Eskimos and Africans are depicted as extremely excitable and as lacking all restraint in displaying their excitement. Thus, they represent a foil against which the men of the dolphin, as well as the missionary, appear particularly rational and serene. The charge of lacking restraint does not only pertain to showing emotion. The Eskimos are also said to lack all restraint when it comes to eating, their, quote, principal and favorite occupation, unquote, and consequently, they are described as being grotesquely fat. 
Interestingly, the accusation of frequent overeating is also often directed against Africans. For example, in Ballantyne's Black Ivory, he has almost a similar statement. And there is yet another feature that links Ballantyne's descriptions of Eskimos to contemporary descriptions of Africans. Both are depicted as lacking moral restraint. In the case of the Eskimos, this is primarily shown by their supposed propensity to stealing. And again, that's something that we often see with Af Africans as well. Um, they, the Eskimos, evidently thought stealing to be no sin and were not the least ashamed of being detected, unquote. In emphasizing the concept of sin and shame, Valentine defines theft not as a legal, but as a moral problem. Furthermore, the Eskimos okay, um, are described as poor creatures and poor fellows in the immediate context of stealing, and while the adjective could be seen as an excuse for the crime, it clearly meant as a comment of their moral depravity. They are poor because they lack the moral guidance of Christian faith. <laughs> Somewhat surprisingly, Valentine says nothing of the Eskimos' lack of a religion in the world of ice, in the shorter tale, Fast in the Ice, um, he does say that they don't have a religion. And again, that is typical of the description of savages. As an aside, the shorter book, Fast in the Ice, um, also suggests yet another level of moral depravity, uh, namely a strange sexual moral depravity. And for time reasons, I'm not reading out the quote, but you can look at it. Um, it's a quote where they all are in, in a hut, huddled together, semi-naked because it's so hot, eating, drifting in and out of sleep. Um, the scene, as I argue, is almost orgiastic, a mass of human bodies sweating, eating, drifting in and out of sleep in semi-nudity. This must have been quite shocking to many Victorian readers, and it clearly is indicative of a lack of moral restraint. But to return to the world of ice, the theft of some valuable articles um, leads to a punitive expedition in which two hostages are taken. When the Eskimos return the items in question, they are forgiven, and a sincere friendship is said to start on this day. And the narrator suggests that the Eskimos are awed into sincere repentance. Strength of muscle and promptitude in action are qualities which all nations in a savage state understand and respect, and the sailors prove that they possess these qualities in a higher degree than themselves during the hardships and dangers incident to Arctic life, while at the same time their seemingly endless resources and contrivances impressed the simple natives with the belief that white men could accomplish anything they choose to attempt. This passage suggests that the Eskimos themselves acknowledge the, superiori the superiority of the English seamen. Again, this is paradoxical since the narrator suggests that the English seamen are stronger and more resourceful than the Eskimos, while the plot of the novel makes it abundantly clear that the men from the Dolphin are very much dependent on the Eskimos' knowledge and skill for their survival. They have to learn how to hunt seal, they have to learn how to um, hunt um, walruses, and you have images from the first edition where it is shown that it's the Eskimos who teach them these kind of things. So they need them um, for their survival. Far from being more resourceful than the natives, the Englishmen are unable to feed themselves and are shown bartering for food at various points in the novel. The fact that Eskimos are able to sell them food is a clear indication that they are much more successful hunters. But Valentine still manages to suggest that the Englishmen are somehow responsible for this success. Of a joint walrus hunt, the narrator relates the following, quote, The Eskimos were in a state of great glee, for previous to the arrival of the sailors, they had been unsuccessful in their hunts and had been living on short allowances. Nonetheless, when the Englishmen first come, they are given food. But they are on short allowances. The Englishmen come, they go out hunting. Hunt is successful. <laughs> Valentine doesn't say it's because of the Englishmen, but clearly the suggestion is there. And of course, the Eskimos are very happy. They're also all, always very happy. And again, that's very often in texts about Africans as well. Admittedly, the statement does not, I've seen it, explicit, um, claim that the success is due to the participation of the sailors, but it is suggested. Thus, the image created by the native inhabitants of the Arctic region is indeed paradoxical. Ballantyne depicts the Eskimos as childlike and ridiculous, as morally depraved, overexcited, and lacking the ability to control their passions and desires, particularly with regard to eating, but as I suggested, there are, there are at least hints that there are also other desires that can't be controlled. At the same time, he shows them to be successful hunters and generally well adapted to their harsh surroundings. At least they survive. 
Indeed, the Englishmen have to imitate their way of dressing, copy their mode of travelling over the ice, and barter for clothes and food at various points in the novel. And when scurvy threatens the crew of the Dolphin, the captain sends out one group of men specifically, quote, to find the Eskimo who would probably have fresh meat in their camp, unquote. Although Ballantyne does not spell this out, the novel indicates that the Englishmen would not have survived the Arctic winter without the help they received from the natives. And the rescue plot that we also have would certainly have failed because um, Fred's father was also found by the Eskimos and rescued by them and kept in their, in their community. While the text uses, utilizes colonial discourse to construct the Eskimos as other to the English sailors, it is unusual in granting them so much local expertise. However, Ballantyne was clearly not able to truly acknowledge the debt his fictional Englishmen owe his fictional Eskimos. Instead, he, not uncharacteristically, puts their success down to providence. As Captain Ellis points out near the end of the novel, quote, there is no spot on earth, I think, equal to the polar regions for bringing out into bold relief two great and apparently antagonistic truths, namely that man's urgent need of all his powers to accomplish the work of his own deliverance and man's utter helplessness and entire dependence on the sovereign will of God. Between achieving man's own deliverance, actively, and the sovereign will of God, sort of passively, the help of the poor, good-natured and excitable and childlike natives is conveniently forgotten. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very interesting and most inspiring, and I'm sure we've got some questions, so um, please. Yeah. Um, no, I don't know any Indians personally, but uh, I wonder if it's a comment on Englishness more than Inuitness, because I think one of the great cultural taboos in English culture is against showing any strong emotions, uh, and, and you're always supposed to appear composed and restrained, and when you're eating, you're supposed to just take small bits of food on your fork at a time, etc. So that is uh, English culture in a nutshell. So it's, it's showcasing Englishness by contrasting it against something that's as un-English as you could possibly imagine. That, that, that's, that's clearly, I mean, as always, this colonial discourse, what colonial discourse does, in fact, is show the self rather than the other. Yeah. The other is used as, as a foil to the self, as a negative image, as a counter image, those things that we don't like we project onto this green of the other. Now with the Eskimo, what I find interesting is, for one, he clearly he uses exactly the same kind of language that you use when depicting Africans, or Indians, um, or Native Americans. You, you get basically the same pattern repeated, with slight variation. Something that I'll, I'll, I want to look into in more detail. Uh, what is interesting is, I mean, Ballantyne actually had had contact with Inuit in Canada. And if you look at some of his Canadian texts, there is, a, there is a clear distinction between Canadian Indians, mainland natives, and those Inuit. And, and he sees one better than the other. Uh, and so it, it is highly complex. And that's what I love about Ballantyne, that it's, at times he can be terribly, terribly colonialist. And then there are texts or passages where he says, wow, where did that come from? Where, where does that awareness suddenly come from? Or that uncertainty that's put in? Um, and that's something that I, I need to go into more. It's not an issue in this text because there are no Native Americans here. But, um, but clearly that's a point. Who's better? Who's better in In that particular case, the Inuits are better. Uh, but that may be because it didn't like that particular tribe uh, of, of Native Canadians. Uh, and, and that's something, as I said, I, I, I need to go into in more detail. Yeah, there are more questions, so please. Well, just something more that had to do with the Arctic <coughs> being seen as a much more uncontrolled region than mainland North America, uh, where you get like the the stereotyping of the stoic Indian chief, who's um, yeah, whose people are past their their day. So it's almost like he's not worried about them um, re resisting anymore. Mm -hmm, whereas mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the depiction of Inuit has to be more. 
unrestrained because you know the, these are the people that haven't been completely you know, subdued to the mm -hmm. colonial power yet. Yeah, possibly. As I said, I'd, well, I need to read up more on that or read more of the Ballantyne text and, and bring them into perspective. And it, it doesn't necessarily say that he um, maintains the same position throughout uh, his oeuvre. Uh, but clearly in the very early text, um, he looks down on certain native Canadian tribes very, very distinctly, which may be partly due to the fact that he's a representative of the Hudson's Bay Company, and if they didn't cooperate with the Hudson's Bay Company, of course, they'd get a bad name. Yeah. So uh, all kinds of things can run into <coughs> each other, which don't necessarily have anything to do with inverted commas race, uh, or the tribe, or, or the social community, but can have other reasons as well. But clearly, there, there, there is a difference. And the Inuit, more, more so than, than Native Canadians or Native Americans, are clearly depicted in the same kind of vein that you find in many texts depicting Africans. Mm. As childlike, compared to monkeys, language compared to gibberish, um, th that kind of thing happens, I think, with Ballantyne certainly more frequently mm. with <coughs> Inuit or people that we now call Inuit um, than, than with Native Canadians. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but there are more we questions. We have to hurry up, yes. Uh, yes, Professor Sassi. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, one comment about Englishness. I don't think it's fair to talk about Englishness. Uh, Valentine is Scottish and um, he has embraced imperialism and it's Britishness. And uh, there is a collusion here between Scotland and England. So we should be careful about the words. That that's one observation, but otherwise I agree with what you said. Um, I think you already answered my partly answered my question, but the, the strangeness of the intelligent and barbarous in the same paragraph. I just wondered if Palantine can be complained up to a certain extent to Kipling, who was obviously uh, you know a king supporter of the British Empire, but nonetheless loved India and yeah. knew it, knew quite a lot. He was informed and. You know, in a book like Kim, it's a very, yeah. so you, as a post-colonialist, you know this, uh, but, but Kim obviously displays both this knowledge, love and admiration, and sense of superiority. But it's a very ambiguous, so I wonder whether this ambiguity can be reconciled yeah. with this. I mean, Kipling knows a lot more about India than Valentine tends to know about the things he writes about. Uh, and you get, you get very interesting glimpses of... Um, cultural relativism in texts about Africa when Valentine mm -hmm. had never been to Africa. Um, in in um, Black Ivory, for example, and of course he has an underclass, working class seaman mm -hmm. voice things like, well, aren't lip rings really the same thing as our earrings? Mm -hmm. So he has, there's a passage that's wonderful, mm -hmm. that's utter, and, and you have to sit there and say, yes, right, that is completely right. Mm -hmm. It's all culture, it's all relative, and it's all taste. But of course you laugh at it, yeah. you're invited to laugh at it because it's a working class character who speaks in dialect mm. and, uh, mm. and the upper class proper English speaking character sort of goes along laughingly. Mm. But, so I think it's, it's slightly different from Kipling who knew India way better uh, than Ballantyne knew most of the things he writes about it and even, uh, even those texts set in, in the north of Canada. Yeah, he was there as a very young man and only for a year and a half or something, or two or three years, something like that. So I, I think with Kipling, it goes deeper. Uh, with Valentine, I, I still haven't up my, made up my mind what, what exactly it is that is with Valentine between being, clearly being a colonialist mm -hmm. and, and yes. also being inspired. I think, because uh, my question was actually maybe to leave a little bit off from that, and in your interpretation then, it sounds like he's maybe actually feeling like he has to tick the boxes of certain things in how he presents these people, but actually he does have that level of respect personally. Is that a fair interpretation, or is it something that he needs a lot more? That's, that's, uh, that sounds very, very sort of controlled. And he's still a young man. It's, it's one of his early books. Mm. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that he's so conscious of what he's doing. I don't think. Uh, obviously, I, I can't look into his head. Um, but clearly, I mean, he, he wants to be a popular writer, he wants to cater to taste, and he wants to write stories that are exciting and, and have that kind of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm still baffled to some extent. That's why I think that the world needs a monograph on Valentine. Um, <laughs> still need a publisher. <laughs> still need to convince a publisher that I should be the one to write it. But, um, yes, please. 
Yes, I was just, um, I was wondering if you'd, um, if you'd read the works of Captain W. Jones, who <coughs> some 60, 70 years later on Biggles. Biggles, the pilot, you really... Uh, I know, I know really Biggles, I know off Biggles. Biggles. Because this is several decades later, more post-colonial yeah. than this even, but exactly the same stuff. Biggles, the ace pilot, flies yeah. all over the world with ginger and algae, mm. and they, they hunt treasure, and they're usually assisted by one... Native African or something, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. has no like Amos speak the truth or something like <laughs> that. And finally, when they, they find the treasure and they fly home with it, they go over the treasure. Amos gets a job as a colonial police sergeant. Or, <laughs> or stays in, 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 in yes. Ballantyne, he'd stay with the missionary uh, and be allowed to marry his sweetheart uh, if they become Christians. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, Ballantyne, that, that's what's fascinating about Ballantyne. He is one of the first ones to write in that mold. He starts publishing in the, in the late 1840s, uh, and all the big names, Henty, Kingston, uh, yeah, yeah. many of them, they come later. Yeah. And um, so in, in many respects, Ballantyne really is part of, of the very few who create the mold that, that then is reused repeatedly. But thank you for that. I've, I don't know Beagles very well, but I know of it. Just time for one more question, if there is any. No, just an observation, actually. It reminded me a little bit, like you were saying about there being cursive, so much of the Willard Price books as well. Um, the adventure stories where they'd go off around the world and capture various different animals and their treatment of, which is a lot more sympathetic in those later years, but again, there were similarities in terms of how it's that post-colonial attitude towards them. Yeah. Towards those. It, it, it is a common, fairly common feature of 19, late 19th century books, of course, but compared with somebody like Henty, um, Ballantyne is much more open-minded in, in many of his texts. I mean, he's much less accurate in terms of history as well. That's what Henty's doing. But um, he certainly is more open-minded and, and mm. at times more, well, it's, it, the texts are ambiguous. There's ambiguity <coughs> there of a sort that you tend not to get in the texts of the 1870s, 1880s so much, um, or, or early 20th century, where the mindset is, I mean, high imperialism starts in the 1870s, 80s. Uh, and, and this very narrow-minded, we, we expand and, and must control the world view is, is taking much more of a hold on the British public imagination as well. So that Ballantyne is, is a bit earlier than that in many of his texts. And, and that is what I think makes him interesting. Okay, we have to stop here. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And thanks Most for inspiring. Thank you.